Today is Litari Sunday, the fourth Sunday of Lent. The epistle is taken from St. Paul's letter to the Galatians, chapter 4. Brethren, it is written that Abraham had two sons, the one by a bondwoman and the other by a free woman. But he was of the bondwoman, was born according to the flesh, but he of the free woman was by promise. Which things are said by an allegory, for these are the two testaments, the one from Mount Sinai, engendering unto bondage, which is Agar, for Sinai is a mountain in Arabia, which hath affinity to that Jerusalem which now is, and is in bondage with her children. But that Jerusalem which is above is free, which is our mother. For it is written, Rejoice, thou barren, that bearest not. Break forth and cry, thou that travailest not, for many are the children of the desolate, more than of her <clears throat> that hath a husband. Now we, brethren, as Isaac was, are the children of promise. But as then, he that was born according to the flesh persecuted him that was after the Spirit, so also it is now. But what saith the Scripture? Cast out the bondwoman and her son, for the son of the bondwoman shall not be heir with the son of the free woman. So then, brethren, we are not the children of the bondwoman, but of the free, by the freedom wherewith Christ has made us free. The Holy Gospel. Taken from St. John, chapter 6. At that time, Jesus went over the Sea of Galilee, which is that of Tiberias. And a great multitude followed him, because they saw the miracles which he did on them that were diseased. Jesus, the, the, Jesus therefore went up into a mountain, and there he sat with his disciples. Now the Pasch, the festival day of the Jews, was ne near at hand. When Jesus therefore had lifted up his eyes, and seen that a very great multitude cometh to him, he said to Philip, when shall we buy bread that these may eat? And this he said to try him, for he himself knew what he would do. Philip answered him, Two hundred penny worth of bread is not sufficient for them, that every one may take a little. One of his disciples, Andrew, the brother of Simon Peter, saith to him, There is a boy here that hath five barley loaves and two fish, but what are these among so many? Then Jesus said, Make the men sit down. Now there was much grass in the place. The men therefore sat down in number about five thousand. So remember what St. Ephraim says. The Jews only counted the men, so this most likely would be easily over ten thousand people, if you included the women and children. And Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed to them that were set down, in like manner also of the fish, as much as they would eat. And when they were filled, he said to his disciples, Gather up the fragments that remain, lest they be lost. They gathered up therefore and filled twelve baskets with the fragments of the five barley loaves, which remained over and above to them that had eaten. Now those men, when they had seen what a miracle Jesus had done, said, this is of a truth, the prophet, that is to come into the world. Jesus therefore, when he knew that they would come to take him by force and make him king, fled again into the mountain himself alone. Thus are the words of the sacred scripture. So here in Minneapolis, St. Paul, Minnesota, we have Mass here today in this little little uh, living room, but nevertheless, if we were in uh, the shacks of Africa, like Archbishop Lefebvre knew, or the cathedrals of Europe, or the big churches that are built here in the U.S., or in the living room, or wherever we are, this is the same sacrifice of the Mass. Our Lord comes down always where the Mass 
is validly offered, and the priest says the uh, says the words of Christ, and offers the tri- at least the Latin rite offers the Tridentine Mass. The sacrifice of Christ is, is truly present, and this Mass is it is built on Saint John's Gospel, chapter six. And I'd like to speak a little bit about this, St. John chapter 6. It's a treasure of a chapter. It's written, of course, St. John was there. He was the one that saw the two fish and five barley loaves. He was the one that saw Christ bless them with the sign of the cross. And he saw Christ gave it to his apostles to start handing out the bread and they had baskets and he put the loaf in and St. John went out and he noticed the basket was full and he handed out bread and the other apostles fish and they went out passing out the miraculous multiplication of the bread and fish it had to be another eye-opener for the apostles to realize just witnessing firsthand this miracle And this will prefigure, of course, the Holy Eucharist, where Christ will distribute it, usually by the Pope, he distributes to all the world the diocese of each bishop. And by the diocese, under the bishop, the parish priests are, are, are assigned over different parishes. So you have the whole hierarchy over the territory of the world. This is what's called the church's jurisdiction that Christ gave to the Pope to, to manage the spreading of the faith and the, sa- the sacraments. So when, the, when Christ told them sit down on the grass and he sent the apostles out, that is the duty of the Pope and the bishops and the priests to pass out the firstly the the Catholic faith the teaching of the faith and then secondly the holy sacrifice of the mass with all the sacraments so in normal times this is how it goes now we know since Vatican II we have this nuclear blast in the church and we don't know how long God is going to allow this punishment on the church we know it will end we know Our Lady will have the victory but in the meantime we got to realize we are in Operation Survival. We are in war zone. We are, as Archbishop Lefebvre put it, we are in the most unusual circumstance. And Archbishop Lefebvre himself, realizing this emergency mode that we're in, he himself flew into many other bishops' dioceses, which was unheard of. <laughs> unheard of, really, since... Um, maybe times of war and maybe times of great heresy like in southern France or persecution but Saint Saint Athanasius he was a bishop that had to go into other dioceses and Saint Eusebius of Samizota had to consecrate bishops to take care that the church would continue the faith would continue so this is what Archbishop Lefebvre did in the face of the whole world being wrapped in this darkness of Vatican II's heresies and errors, and the new Mass hitting in all the parishes, Archbishop Lefebvre was forced to go all over the world into other bishops' dioceses. And that's because of the Operation Survival. Now, it seems clearly that Bishop Follet wants to end this Operation Survival, that it's no longer in the emergency uh, mode. And he's already willing to be recognized. They already got the sacraments of confession, of uh, ordinations and marriage approved, recognized by Rome. And which Rome are we talking about? It's the modernist Rome. And Rome has not come back to the Catholic faith of tradition. Rome is not professing the anti-modernist oath and the kingship of Christ of Pius XI. And... uh, the syllabus of errors and all the condemnations of communism, socialism and liberalism and the Rome is not professing this so it is not the time to make peace 
with the enemies, the wolves that have invaded our church. It's not time to make peace. They hold the seats, but until they profess the faith of all time, we cannot even submit to be so-called recognized or approved because to be recognized and approved means you have in some way, there's always some catch to submit to Vatican II and the New Mass. A perfect example is, I understand, St. Peter's Society, the Fraternity of St. Peter. They've asked the Pope permission to use the pre-55 Holy Week this year. The Holy Week but from before Pope Pius XII, the old Holy Week. And he gave permission which is surprising, but the catch is they have to use the new prayer for the Jews. They have to use the new prayer, which the old prayer was very clear. Perfidious Jews, and you don't genuflect for them because they use the genuflection to mock Christ. So you see there's always some catch. And we're going to be in this Operation Survival until Rome comes back to tradition. And this is all, all of us are suffering through this. It is a great trial on, on the whole church, especially those who want to stay faithful to Catholic tradition. And this is the time, especially in Lent, raise your tears to God, raise your heart to God, offer your penances and your sacrifices to end this terrible punishment on the church, which is with the darkness in Rome. But as for the truth, as for the true Mass, as for the true faith, we stay with that. And the glorious days of the Church will come back. But now God wants us fighting in the trenches. And that's just the way it is. So, this chapter 6 of St. John, <clears throat> I'd like to just briefly go through parts of it. Firstly, it is in March of the second year of our Lord's life, a public life. So our Lord is 32 years old. It's a year before He's crucified. And He just worked the miracle of feeding 5,000 men plus all the women and children. So probably easily up to 10,000 people. And in the Gospel of the Mass... Now when they had seen the miracle Jesus had done, they said, this is of a truth, the prophet, that is to come into the world. And this is where the gospel ends today. But then it goes on to say, and this is of great interest, because there's a reason Mother Church chose this gospel for this Sunday. Part of it is because this is the week of Moses. In the pre-reading of the breviary, Moses is the prefiguring of Christ, as well as Adam, Noah, Abraham, Isaac. Now is Moses. And Moses, as you know, is going to come up in the St. John chapter 6. And that's why the church uses this gospel, because uh, Moses led the people from the slavery of Egypt. He led the, some several million of the Israelites across the Red Sea. And the army of Pharaoh was destroyed in the Red Sea from the, when the walls came crashing down. Archaeologists today, the scuba diver, divers, find chariot wheels, they find horse bits, they find spurs, they find even um, swords and uh, other markings of horses at the bottom of the sea, which... <laughs> Archaeology and true science always supports the book of Genesis, always in the scriptures. And then, so that prefigures baptism. And then Moses, the people are hungry, and Moses prays, and God sends them manna, that is, something like a, a big, huge rice krispies that would, that would whiten the grounds of the desert every morning. And every morning they gathered together, each one, his portion of food for the day. And if he got too greedy and took others' portions, uh, the worms appeared and ate it. So it was very strange things, but it was very nourishing. And for all the 40 years of the desert, this is what they ate. And of course, this prefigures the sacrament of the Holy Eucharist. And, and Christ is going to bring that up 
in this gospel here. And then Moses strikes the rock, the water gushes out. And Christ, that prefigures the heart of Jesus in the sacrifice of the Mass. The priest strikes the rock, which is Christ, with the twofold words of consecration, says St. Leo the Great. And at the, at the words of consecration, the sacrifice of Christ is reenacted, and the gushing flood of graces flows from the altar. So that the more thirsty you are for grace, for God's mercy, for God's charity, He fills you. And the more stingy we are with God, and the less we love Him, the less He fills us. So the, the, the lack is not on the part of God. He's over generous, infinitely generous. The selfishness, stinginess, and the low quantities comes from our lack of love. And that's why we got to ask the grace of God, move my heart to love you more and more and more, always to increase. And we must increase in charity all the time till the day we die. And this increasing is not adding on more prayers or adding on more reading or adding on even more external activity. It is rather the intensity, like turning up the volume on a stereo. The, it's, it's turning up the heat on the stove. That's what, what St. Thomas Aquinas means by the increase of charity towards God. So we want to ask that. And, uh, and then Moses will lead them in the desert. Everything he does will be pre prefiguring Christ giving us the sacraments. So here's what happens. St. John chapter 6. This is right after today's Gospel. Jesus, therefore, when he knew that they would come to take him by force and make him king, fled again to the mountain himself alone. Because he didn't want to be a king that would be like, pardon me, a burger king. Like a king who would be a head chef and just feed everybody. And he would lead the, Roman, lead the Jewish armies into Rome and have a ticket parade by conquering them. That's not the idea of the king. Christ came to be king over men's souls, over all nations, but firstly over men's hearts and their minds, and that we love Him as our God. And that's what He says. And when evening was come, His disciples went down to the sea. And when they had gone up into a ship, they went over the sea to Capernaum. And it was now dark, and Jesus was not come unto them. And the sea arose by reason of a great wind that blew. When they had rowed, therefore, about 520 or 30 furlongs, they see Jesus walking upon the sea and drawing nigh to the ship, and they were afraid. So they see our Lord walking on the water. But he saith to them, It is I, be not afraid. They were willing, therefore, to take him into the ship. And presently the ship was at... And here's, here's an interesting verse. And presently the ship was at the land to which they were going. So the fathers of the church say, like St. John Chrysostom and St. Cyril, they were in the sea, in the middle of the sea. They see Christ. And suddenly... He, he, is, he enters into the boat, and they're already at land. And the fathers of the church say, they had just suddenly traveled over eight to nine miles on the sea. So it was a miraculous trip. <laughs> kind of like driving with John Kowalik. Oh. <laughs> you you're, you're end up very quickly at the place you're destined to. But with our Lord, it was truly miraculous. Eight or nine miles, they're, at the, they're already at the shore. And this surprises the apostles already. Another miracle Christ does. But he says to them, It is I, be not afraid. They were willing therefore to take him into the ship, and presently the ship was at the land to which they were going. <clears throat> the next day, the multitude that stood on the other side of the sea saw that there was no other ship there but one. And that Jesus had not entered into the ship with his apostles, but that his disciples were gone away alone. So the people picked up on this. 
They saw Jesus didn't get in the boat. He went to the mountains. The apostles went in the boat. And on the other side, the next day, those that took the ship across, they see Jesus coming with his apostles and landing on the shore. And they recognize this. But other ships came in from Tiberias, nigh unto the place where they had eaten the bread, the Lord giving thanks. When therefore the multitude saw that Jesus was not there, nor his disciples, they took shipping and came to Capernaum seeking for Jesus. And when they had found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when camest thou hither? When did you get here? We didn't see you get in the boat with the apostles. So it's hidden from the people, but the apostles know. And St. Gregory of Nazianzen says that those who travel with Christ in this life always arrive safely and always arrive in a way sooner. Jesus answered them and said, Amen, Amen, I say to you, you seek me. Not because you have seen miracles, but because you did eat of the loaves and were filled. So Christ sees their hearts. The Jews are wanting him to provide him, them forever a, a, a lifelong food bank. That's what they're looking for. And they're not even loving our Lord because of his miracles. But Christ corrects them. He says this. Verse 27, St. John chapter 6. <coughs> Labor not for the meat which perishes. So don't be seeking me for food that dies and dies with you. But labor for the meat which endureth unto life everlasting, which the Son of Man will give you. For him hath God the Father sealed. Now, the every verse of this, there's... Fathers of the church have tons of commentary. For, for him hath God the Father sealed. God the Father sealed it by twice. The voice of the Father says, This is my beloved Son. Actually three times. This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. He seals his mission. The mission of the Son on earth. And of course Christ is sealed also. That is Christus means anointed. When we call Christ, and that comes from the Greek word Christus, which means one who has been anointed. And how was Christ anointed? We read this in our catechism, by the hypostatic union, where the divine person assumed the human nature. So Christ is sealed by the Father. That is, He is truly God, and the person of God, and not the person of man. He has man's nature, but He's not the person of man. Then the next verse, they said therefore unto him, What shall we do that we may work the works of God? Jesus answered and said to them, This is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he hath sent. They said therefore to him, What sign therefore dost thou show, that we may see and may believe thee? What dost thou work? Now think of their state of mind. They just saw a miraculous crowd of up to 10,000 people getting, being fed. They just, certainly the apostles saw the miraculous traveling of 8 to 10 miles in an instant. Our Lord had cured many thousands of people already, and they're asking for a sign. It shows, it shows really their, their hard hearts of the Jews. And here they bring up... <clears throat> Our fathers did eat manna in the desert, as it is written, He gave them bread from heaven to eat. So in other words, as Father Cornelius Alapide says, they, the Jews believed Moses because Moses had food every day. Christ worked this miracle once, and then He's going to work it another time, and they're expecting something greater than Moses. Feed us every day. And feed everybody every day, and then we'll believe you. <coughs> then Jesus said to him, to them, Amen, Amen, I say to you, Moses gave you not bread from heaven, but my Father giveth you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is that which cometh down from heaven, 
and giveth life to the world. They said therefore unto him, Lord, give us always this bread. So you see, the Jews are thinking always materialistically. Give us this bread. But Christ raises their minds. And Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall not hunger, and he that believeth in me shall never thirst. But I, say, I said unto you, that you also have seen me, and you believe not. All that the Father giveth to me shall come to me, and him that cometh to me I will not cast out. Because I came down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him that sent me. Now this is the will of the Father who sent me, that of all that he has given me, I should lose nothing, but should raise it up again on the last day. And this is the will of my Father that sent me, that everyone who sees the Son and believeth in him may have life everlasting, and I will raise him up in the last day. So our Lord refers a lot to this, I will raise him up on the last day. And St. Thomas Aquinas points out that one of the effects of the Holy Eucharist is we will rise on the last day. And many, many Catholics receive communion who are in hell, and they will also rise on the last day. And all the Muslims and Jews will rise on the last day. But those who truly believe our Lord, who keep His commandments, die in the state of grace, by the power of the Holy Eucharist, they will rise glorious on the last day. And this is what our Lord means. They will rise in glory. They will rise with the state of grace shining through the body. The Jews therefore murmured at Him, because He had said, I am the living bread which came down from heaven. Now, remember the city where Christ was born, Bethlehem. Bethlehem means house of bread. And St. Gregory makes this point, and St. Bernard, the house of bread is Bethlehem. And they said, verse 42, Is not this Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How then saith he, I came down from heaven? So the Jews... They're only, again, thinking materialistically. They know St. Joseph of Nazareth. They know the Virgin Mary. But they don't know the divine origin, the miracle of Christ's conception by the power of the Holy Ghost, and that He's the person of God. But Christ is proving it to them by His miracles. And this is why other, at another time Christ will say, If you don't believe my words, believe my works. The works proclaim, I am God. So, Jesus therefore answered and said to them, Murmur not among yourselves. No man can come to me unless the Father who has sent me draw him, and I will raise him up on the last day. It is written in the prophets, and they shall all be taught of God. Everyone that has heard of the Father and hath learned cometh to me. So here our Lord is showing that it is truly a special grace, a divine election to receive the Catholic faith. It's a great grace of God and He must draw us from eternity. Not that any man has seen the Father, but he who is of God, he has seen the Father. So Christ is speaking now of Himself. He has seen the Father, He is with the Father from all eternity, and He is of God, and He has seen the Father. Verse 47, Amen, Amen, I say unto you, He that believeth in Me hath life everlasting. I am the bread of life. Your fathers did eat manna in the desert, and are dead. This, and he's pointing to himself here, this is the bread which cometh down from heaven, that if any, if any man eat of it, he may not die. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If any man eat of this bread, he shall live forever. And the bread that I shall give is my flesh for the life of the world. 
Now the Jews are gathered together. Christ is in the synagogue at this point teaching. He's in the synagogue and it's packed full with the Jews. And his apostles are there near him. And he's saying these words. And these people are starting to get, they're starting to shake their heads. And they're starting to hear, eat his flesh, drink his blood. What's he talking about? And Christ is very emphatic. And this is something that always stumps me with the Protestants, right? The Protestants always claim to take the Bible literally. And if they take the Bible literally, how come they have a problem accepting the Holy Eucharist? Which, where Christ is literally saying, the Holy Eucharist is my blood, my blood and my flesh for the life of the world. What's their problem? Now, I knew a Protestant minister who, I didn't know him as a Protestant, he, he had converted and become Catholic. And he became Catholic because he saw at the Mass, the priest elevates the sacred host and the chalice at the consecration. And he knew the words of Christ that, I, if I be lifted up, I will draw all things to myself. So he knew, of course, of the cross, being Christ lifted up on the cross. But when he saw the connection to the Mass, and he, he studied St. John chapter 6, which is what we're going through here, he realized this is really what Christ was talking about himself in the Holy Eucharist and he gives himself in the sacrifice of the Mass which which reenacts the sacrifice of Calvary and in the Mass we truly eat of his flesh and blood and this is what Christ is speaking about here he goes on if any man eat of this bread he shall live forever and the bread that I will give is my flesh for the life of the world now picture yourself in that synagogue hearing this for the first time. All right, there are many things in the in that Christ speaks, and many things we read in Scripture we, which we don't understand because it's just far above us. We sit, we pray the Psalms every day in the seminary in uh, Kentucky, and in every monastery, convent, down the history of the church, always chanted the Psalms, and there are some Psalms that are very difficult to, to understand <laughs> and you might even read the, fa the commentaries of many fathers and it's still difficult to comprehend because God is infinitely above us and he says many things that are difficult to understand and this is one of them the Holy Eucharist how is it going to happen how is he going to give us this flesh to eat but he's going to and he's saying it here the Jews therefore strove among themselves saying how can this man give us his flesh to eat? What is this? Cannibalism? What is this? Then Jesus said to them, Amen, Amen, I say unto you. Now notice Christ doesn't back down. He doesn't come and say, well, all right, I really mean it only symbolically. you got to understand me. It's analogical. It's symbolic. It's a way of poetry. Does Christ speak that way? Not at all. He doesn't back down with the truth. And the truth divides. As we're going to see, he's going to, all these Jews are going to walk out. And Jesus said to him, Amen, Amen, I say unto you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you shall not have life in you. And of course, he means firstly the physical life, because the Holy Eucharist strengthens the physical life. And there are numerous saints, St. Saint Catherine of Siena, is one of them, and St. John Vianney, who lived basically only on the Holy Eucharist, miraculously. So truly it can be bred physically for the, for the body, but our Lord mainly means, of course, the life of the soul. Because when you receive communion, the host you receive, the consecrated host, is truly Christ's full blood body, and you drink His blood. You truly drink His blood in the Holy Communion. And the soul of Christ, which is divine, and the divinity of Christ, which is div his divine eternal person, with the Father and the Holy Ghost. So, by extension, you receive the Father and the Holy Ghost in communion. And also physically by extension, Bishop Sheen said this, and St. Thomas mentions it also, in when you receive Holy Communion, by extension, 
Since he was born of the blood of the Virgin Mary, you also receive the virginal blood of the Virgin Mary, by extension. So think of that. But it's the living God we receive. So, um, so the life that he's talking about is firstly physical, yes, but mainly the life of the soul by sanctifying grace. And when the Holy Communion is dissolved in our stomachs and, and is digested, no longer is the Eucharistic species there. But the presence of God's divinity, Christ in us, is there with sanctifying grace and is increased with every Holy Communion. Or, if, I were to, if someone receives in mortal sin, it brings death to the soul. It adds another mortal sin of sacrilege. And, and also can cause physical death. St. Bernard talks about this. He talks about how, he says in one sermon, notice how many times there are sudden deaths after Easter. And he says it's because God punishes all the Catholics who go to communion in the state of mortal sin. Because it's the law of the church, we've got to go to communion during Easter time, right? So the Catholics, many of them go without going to confession before and repenting of their sins. So they make sacrilegious communions. And St. Bernard says God often punishes it with a sudden death. So, next verse. He that eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood hath life everlasting, and I will raise him up on the last day. So this is the power of the Holy Eucharist. It, it gives us thing divine grace. It gives us a continually outpouring of grace. And it gives us the power after our death to rise again glorious on the day of judgment. For my flesh is meat indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He that eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood abideth in me, and I in him. So this is really the excess of God's love that he wants to be in us, in our very blood, body, blood, soul, and divinity, uh, in our very human nature, his divinity with our human nature. So as a flame, says St. Cyril, as wax that's mixed and becomes one, so Christ mixes us with him. And in the Mass, when the altar boy presents the, the water, the one drop of water is poured into the chalice, into the wine, before it's consecrated. And that water becomes one with the wine, and is changed into the very blood of Christ. And that's what Christ wants. He wants us one with Him by sanctifying grace. One with Him by doing His will. One with Him by professing the holy faith that comes to us from the Blessed Trinity, which is the Roman Catholic faith of all, of all time. So notice he's very explicit about eating his flesh and drinking his blood. And of course, he means sacramentally. We know that. But you still receive truly the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Christ. As the living Father has sent me, and I live by the Father, and this life is from eternity in the Blessed Trinity, so he that eateth me, the same shall also live by me. So when you receive communion and live in God's grace, you're living one with the Blessed Trinity. And that's why our hearts have to be anchored in heaven. This is the bread that came down from heaven, not as your fathers did eat manna and are dead. He that eateth this bread shall live forever. These things he said, teaching in the synagogue in Capernaum. And then, here we go. What are the after effects of this bomb? <laughs> What's the after effects of these words? The truth divides. Here, here we go. Many therefore of his disciples, hearing it, said, This saying is hard. Who can bear it? And they went out. And, but Jesus, knowing in himself that his disciples murmured at this, said to them, Does this scandalize you? If then you shall see the Son of Man ascend up where he was before. It is the Spirit that giveth life, the flesh profiteth nothing. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and life. So the flesh profits nothing, and yet Christ is saying, Eat my flesh, meaning that he will give this his flesh sacramentally. 
sacramentally. But there are some of you that believe not, for Jesus knew from the beginning who they were that did not believe and who he was that would betray him. And he said, Therefore did I say unto you that no man can come to me unless it be given him by my Father. After this many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. So you see, uh, the truth divides. The truth divides. Uh, Protestantism, they couldn't swallow Catholic truth. They divided from the church. Communists divide from the church. Those who want to live in mortal sin and, and uh, remarry and divorce and remarry, they divide themselves from the, the life of grace. So after this, many disciples no more walked with him. And, and Archbishop Lefebvre used to say that this change of the faith with Vatican II is a history of separations. <clears throat> we have to separate ourselves from the conciliar church to stay Catholic. And, we, and now since 2012, we've got to separate ourselves from Bishop Follet's wanting to put himself one with the conciliar church, and he's even dropped using that term now, and the compromise of the faith. So we have to separate from that compromise and stay with the full Catholic truth. The full unity of the faith of all the saints, doctors, popes of tradition. And that means we got to separate from those false compromises. And that goes also for the, the fake resistance, which is trying to bend backwards to justify Vatican II in the New Mass, saying it's bad, but you can get grace from the New Mass, saying it's bad, but Vatican II uh, does have so many good points. So we, we have to separate from any dissolving of Christ, because who dissolves Christ is of the Antichrist, says St. John. Who dissolves Jesus Christ, divides him, is of the Antichrist. Vatican II, and all those that want to compromise it in any way, divide and dissolve Christ. And Christ can't be dissolved, he's always one. The Catholic faith is always one, always the same. So, it, it, the, it, already Christ is seeing divisions. And he doesn't call them back, it's, he speaks the truth. And he goes actually a step farther in the next verse. Then Jesus said to the twelve, will you also go away? So here he's putting his apostles on, on the sizzler, on the stove. And each one of them, each one of us is put to the test. Every one of us. And all the apostles, St. Peter speaks for them and says, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of everlasting life. And all the apostles agree with St. Peter, except one. And there's a, even a further division among his bishops. And that is Judas. But they don't know it. Judas doesn't say anything. But in his heart, and St. John mentions this, Christ says, Have I not chosen twelve? And one of you is a devil. And Judas in his heart denied the Holy Eucharist. He didn't believe the whole Catholic faith. And part of the whole Catholic faith is we must believe in the Holy Eucharist. And Judas didn't. Bishop Sheen says, this is where Judas started to change. So it's a year before Christ's crucifixion, Judas turns to the dark side. He does not profess the full Catholic faith. And then he goes and makes friends, and as he has been already, with the, the high priests in Jerusalem, who are plotting already Christ's death. They already are jealous of him, full of hate and full of vice. So... Judas Iscariot will be the division that will show up later. So, who can know men's hearts but God alone? But the Catholic Church down history will always be attacked, always have weeds inside it. As our Lord said, He compared it to a field with weeds. But the Catholic faith itself is one holy Catholic apostolic. And it is holy. And it is one by the doctrine, by the participation of the same sacraments, the same holy sacrifice, and under one head. The, the, the invisible head is Christ, 
The visible head is the Pope. And our visible head now, we, we're all suffering under these modernist Popes. And we, nor do we fall into the set of a contest error to say, well, they're bad Popes, so they're not Popes. They're Popes. And we have so many examples in the Old Testament of bad kings, bad high priests, bad leaders, who God did not remove from their leadership or their priesthood, but they stayed priests or they stayed kings or they stayed leaders, but they were bad. And when God gives bad leaders, says the Holy Ghost, it is a punishment on the world or a punishment over a given people. So we are suffering now perhaps the greatest punishment ever in the history of the church, which is a series of five popes who are all attacking the Catholic faith, promoting Vatican II and the new mass. And what's the worst consequence is what Our Lady Fatima made very clear. It means the damnation of many, many souls. Many souls going to hell. So let us really ask the Virgin Mary. She, um, Mary of Agreda, says that our Lord gave the Virgin Mary a special privilege that when she received communion, our Lord, the Eucharistic species was always with her. She was like a walking ciborium or a walking monstrance. The Holy Eucharist was always in her. So she always kept Christ next to her, as well as being in the state of grace, as well as being full of grace. So let's consecrate ourselves to the Virgin Mary and be generous in these next days of Lent to really beg God to make reparation for our sins, for the sins of the whole world, and to really beg God, hasten that hour of Our Lady's victory. Please give us finally a Pope who will obey Our Lady, consecrate Russia, and in the end, my Immaculate Heart will triumph, Our Lady said. So we have great hope and confidence in her own words. So let's go now to the Holy Sacrifice, where St. John chapter 6 becomes a reality on the altar. O Mary conceived without sin. O Mary conceived without sin. O Mary conceived without sin. In the name of the Father, Son, Holy Ghost. Amen.